Good evening and welcome to another session of the Vermont Law School Embedded Racism in the Law panel series. My name is Arielle King and I am a 3L and student ambassador here at VLS. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Embedded Racism in the Law series began this summer following the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Since July, Vermont Law School has hosted panels every other Thursday evening about the different ways racism is embedded into our legal system, hosting conversations between our professors and other guest experts. You can access all past recordings through the Vermont Law School website and Facebook page. We welcome questions uh, from the audience, so if at any point you would like to ask a question, simply type it in the chat box and we will get to it. Um, or as many of them as we can as possible during the Q&A session at the end of this panel today. Tonight's discussion is entitled, The Embedded Racism of Public School Discipline. This presentation will provide the context and legal framework for school discipline policies nationwide and in Vermont, and we'll discuss the efforts to end the presence of police in our children's schools. We have two speakers joining us today to share some of their expertise. First is Professor Matthew Bernstein. Matthew Bernstein came to Vermont Law School in 2019 from Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he was the staff, senior staff attorney at Pegasus Legal Services for Children. In this capacity, he represented children in abuse and neglect and special education cases and focused on stopping the school to prison pipeline. He is a child welfare law specialist as certified by the National Association of Counsel for Children. He graduated with honors from the University of New Mexico School of Law in 2014. He also holds a master's degree in United States history from UNM, where his thesis focused on racial justice in education and a level two New Mexico's teacher's license. Prior to attending Vermont Law School, uh, Matthew taught English, history, and economics at Amy Beal High School in downtown Albuquerque. We are also joined with Marilyn Mahosky. Marilyn is a lifelong legal service attorney uh, who works as a staff attorney with the Disability Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid. She represents individuals with disabilities who have legal issues arising out of their disabilities. She practices in state and federal court and before administrative agencies. As a strong believer in the power of public education, Ms. Mahosky um, cares deeply about ensuring that we all have access to education. So thank you all for joining us today and now we'll just have our panelists take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Um, so thank you so much everyone for being here. Um, and uh, we, we have a, a somewhat rambly slide presentation for you. Um, we have a lot to share and, um, you, you know, I mean, the, the organization here is, is challenging because there's so many intersecting issues. So, um, you know, please, please save your questions for the end and, and please, please, you know, um, ask us if something's not clear, but we're happy to, to dialogue with you and we're, and we're really glad that you're here. So thank you. Um, so we're going to be asking um, our host here to click through the slides um, and um, so bear with us there as well. So if you could click to the, the next slide. Um, and while you're doing that, thank you. Um, I'll just say that, you know, Marilyn and I were, were talking before about, um, Ariel asked us how we knew each other. And, and, you know, I was trying to figure it out. And basically, you know, I sort of was looking for who did this work in Vermont when, when I came here. And I, you know, basically cold called Marilyn and I was saying Marilyn was uh, nice enough to answer my call, and she, and and you know the collegiality in this profession, especially of people who work with kids in the legal profession, is is very high because it's hard work and important work. And so, if you're interested in, in any of this, you know, I would say my door is always open. So please please reach out um, if you have any questions or interest in this kind of law, because it's sort of there's there's high barriers to entry in, for a variety of reasons, which we can get into. Um, but the community is very strong and it's and it's it's such great work and so um, inspiring. So just wanted to put that out there. So um, I'll turn it over to Marilyn just one second to, to introduce herself. But th this slide, um, you know, this is the, the motto of Vermont Law School. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll just say that this this will speak for itself, how this um, law for the community and the world will emerge through um, through our discussion today. Um, before we continue, I'd just like to send um, shout outs to um, Dean Shirley Jefferson. Um, for you know being the the main driver behind racial justice at Vermont Law School and and beyond, and for being an inspiration um, to me, I'd also like to shout out Carla Baron, who um, is a is a community member at VLS, who um, has shared a lot of useful information with me, um, and um, also to everyone else working on racial justice issues at, at Vermont Law School. And I'm the co-chair of the diversity committee. 
at VLS. And, you know, I'll just say there's a lot of work we have to do. So thanks. So, uh, Marilyn. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Ariel, for the nice introduction. So I'm getting some feedback. Am I, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay. Um, that's better. Thank you. I wanted to say thank you to Ariel for the introduction and Matthew, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, uh, next slide to the legal aid slide. <laughs> so uh, strong shout out to Vermont Legal Aid. Um, so we are a civil legal, le civil legal services program um, statewide. There are five offices around um, Vermont. There We have 10 projects. I'm in actually two of the, the, the 10 projects, the Disability Law Project, and I also represent Victims of Crime under our um, Victim of Crime Act grant. Um, my work tends to focus on, um, is in the area of education um, relative to people with disabilities. So let me, I switched that and set it backwards. But um, much of my work in the last 25 plus years has been representing children with disabilities in the arena of special education. I also have experience in representing people in housing and employment and discrimination, access to public benefits, um, which is a lot of what we do at Vermont Legal Aid. Of the cases that we get at Vermont Legal Aid, I would, in the Disability Law Project, um, about 30% of those cases are focused on special education. We don't get any special funding to do, uh, represent in, in that area. Uh, it's part of a bigger grant, but um, we don't get any dedicated funding, but it, it's a significant portion of the calls that we get is in the area of special education. Under our VOCA grant, we've also started to expand our focus and begin to represent um, children uh, who may have um, complaints against school districts on the basis of um, race or um, discrimination. So that's another area that we're exploring. So it's been uh, kind of, I think, ties nicely with the work that we're doing, but I'm really excited to be a part of this. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Marilyn. And um, yeah, I, I, thank you for, for being here. I think, um, you know, having somebody on the ground in Vermont um, is, is really important for this work. And um, if we could just go to the next slide. Um, uh, thanks. So um, here's here's an overview of what we're gonna we're gonna talk about today. Um, and as I said, it's a little bit, you know, we, we just we struggled with the organization because so many of these issues really flow into each other. Um, so you know, if if there's a if there's a gap in what we're saying, it's probably going to be filled in a little bit later. But so first, we're going to talk about terminology, um, the scope of the problem that we're describing today, um, and then sort of dive in some long-term consequences of disciplinary exclusion education as a civil right, the importance of disability in all of this, um, young children in school discipline, discretionary treatment, Gospi Lopez, and then looking forward, hopefully ending on, on some positive notes or at least some, some thoughts about how we as a community move forward. Um, so, next. Marilyn, did you want to say anything about this agenda? Um, no, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> next slide, thanks. Um, so, so um, just a couple, yeah, you go ahead, no. No, no, you go ahead, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so just a couple of disclaimers. Mm -hmm. Yes, just a couple of disclaimers. You know, we can't give you legal advice if you have a particular question. Um, you, you know, you can, um, we can we can send you we we can send you to the rights uh, we, we can you know talk about statutes and speak in general but we we don't represent you so this is not considered legal advice um, you know we just wanted to put up here we're not neutral I mean I'm a, I'm a professor of VLS um, you know there's some uh, patina of neutrality or objectivity whatever that is um, but both uh, Marilyn and I are advocates on behalf of of kids and young people and. Um, I guess I just wanted to say about that, you know, that does result in in me and and also obviously Marilyn, you know, suing, doing things like suing schools and saying that, um, you know, teachers have have done things that are wrong. And um, I, I just wanted to say that despite that, you know, I um, I still wear the hat of a teacher, and I, you know, my wife is an occupational therapist in in the public schools, and um, you know, I greatly respect the work teachers do, and I think that, but so, sometimes that can be a complicated position to to occupy. Um, you know, I think the, the intersection is if you believe in, in kids and their, their right to an education and the power of an education, broadly speaking, 
um, then you do what it takes to ensure that that happens and you fight injustice in whatever context, um, in wh whatever place you are in whatever context you're in. And if that means suing a school, sometimes it means um, suing a school. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, that we are two white people presenting this information. And, you know, we were hoping to have um, a third member, somebody who had sort of direct lived experience, um, you know, with school discipline. It's a little bit complicated to, to, to do that, especially as attorneys and, you know, asking our clients or former clients to do that. Um, in the future, I would like to have another, you know, a panel of, of young people who have sort of this direct lived experience. Marilyn and I have experienced as attorneys in this field. But that's different than somebody who really has a lot more to lose. And, you know, Brian Stevenson talks about proximity. Um, and, you know, I'll just say that as an attorney, I've learned the, the most I've learned in my work has been when I've been in proximity with young people who have had um, very challenging lives and, and to see what they've um, the way in which they navigate those. So, um, Marilyn, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll, I'll add in something here. Um, so, yeah, thank you. I think that was a great kind of intro to where we are and and uh you know i grew up with public high school teachers and have and come from a long line of um, public school uh educators both at the high school and college level um and so and i've also served on a school board and chair of a school board and chair of a supervisory union school board so i'm actually very supportive of public education um around the country and particularly in vermont um but i also am a strong advocate for for justice, and I think that that the work that I do, with special education, is a justice issue. It's an you know it's an it's an access issue for kids with disabilities. And as I've gotten into this work, and as as um, the the racial justice movement, for lack of a better word, of of George Floyd and what was going on this summer, I you know, it ties in. It just it's interesting how things kind of all come together. And we're at this point now where we're we're discussing the intersectionality between disability and um, other kinds of um, discrimination. And it all comes to a head in public education in our country. So next slide. So as Matthew and I were sort of preparing for this, we had different kind of, we, we came at this differently. And uh, as we've talked about it, we finally decided that what we needed to do was, was label this as terminology. So um, the title of this presentation is Embedded, The Embedded Racism of Public Discipline. And I think I tend to look at this or think about it as exclusionary discipline. So what do we mean by that? What we mean is the removal of kids from a learning environment. Um, in, in out and about, it's it's being commonly referred to as a school to prison pipeline. Um, so uh, the when the Congress reauthorized this, the uh, ESSA, which is the Early and Secondary Element Education Act, um, which was which followed the the No Child Left Behind Act that was uh, passed in the early, um, under President Bush, um, we started sort of noticing that kids are being criminalized for behavior um, that's often related to their, um, to, to age appropriate behavior, developmentally appropriate for kids their age. And it has consequences. Um, when we remove kids from an educational environment and we put them in the criminal justice system, we're, we're penalizing them um, and we're not educating them. And so that's kind of what we're talking about today is that intersection between education, the lack of an education, that's what happens. Kids, the biggest consequence to kids when they don't have access to an education, um, it, it truly has lifelong effects. So we're gonna probably interchangeably refer to, you know, suspension, which is you're kicked out of school for a few days, you're expelled, which means you may be out for the rest of the school year. Um, and you may also be arrested in school or referred to law enforcement, and then you could end up as a student in the criminal justice system. So okay, next thanks. slide. So, um, okay, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, Matthew, go ahead. Could I explain that real quick? Yeah, can we go back one, sorry. Um, just, just real quick on the school to prison pipeline, thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a huge, um, I don't really, I don't think school to prison pipeline is the best ter term anymore. I think it's sort of, it's become a little bit loaded and I feel like it's easily dismissed, um, but it's, it's 
it is it is it is one conceptual framework for understanding this and so you know really the point of this quote here which is you know old at this point but the reason why i like this is because there's sort of there's two different um there's there's twin phenomenon broadly speaking here one is that young people and students are are criminalized um and and you know ultimately potentially incarcerated which is you know the worst thing um and then on the flip side um they're less likely to have a high quality education and those two things spiral together of course um you, you know it's whichever one happens first is not always clear they, they're 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 intertwined um but but basically that's that's what we're looking at here we're looking at criminalization and we're looking at lack of education and those two things are both significant issues um and you know exclusionary discipline is is is, is, is another useful way to think about this so i you know i think these are these are all useful concepts um, so thank you slide Please. So, scope of the problem. Um, when we think about exclusionary discipline or school to prison pipeline, what are we talking about? Um, we're talking we're talking about research that's um, come to light and that's been done over the last really 15, 10 to fifteen years. Um, it's it's when uh, it, I'm sorry. This is kind of a strange format. <laughs> I'm not used to this try, trying to talk so casually on on a, on a um, on a screen here. So my apologies. Um, what we know from research is that black students are suspended and expelled at a rate three times higher than white students are. We know that black girls are suspended at higher rates than any other group, twelve percent. We know that Native American and Native Alaskans who represent less than 1% of the student population, um, students enrolled in school are suspended um, at 2% and they're expelled at 3% rates. So when you think about that in terms of like thinking about the Native American and, I, and that's a population, an indigenous population here in Vermont that is, is affected because we are a relatively small state. We are a state that has a relatively small population um, of people of color. And so uh, when you think that there's small numbers of people and yet the rates of suspension are relatively high for that rate, for that group. I think it's also important to point out that these statistics, even though um, Vermont is consistent with that. So my practice is in Vermont, in Vermont. Matthew's done a lot of his work in, in New Mexico. But as we've talked over the years, we've come to realize that the, the the issues are the same across the country. They may have a slightly different uh, complexion or um, manner in which they manifest themselves in, in individual states. But the reality is, is that kids of color um, are disproportionately impacted um, and receive the harshest um, consequences for school discipline, that they're kicked out more often um, and they're expelled more often than white students are um, across the country. Yeah, thanks. And if I could just add to that, I mean, I used to work in New Mexico, which is a majority minority. It's really plural, plurality minority state. In other words, um, white white people are not the majority there. They don't hold, the, they're not the, the largest um, of the racial groups there. Um, Latino people are, are more prevalent in New Mexico. And um, there's a significant Native American population as well um, in Albuquerque, native um, urban population, um, as well as, you know, there's also remote tribal areas and each of those entities have unique characteristics in terms of the way um, all of this works. And, you know, those of you that have stud studied tribal law know that it can get very complicated. You have a public school on tribal lands, you know, who's administering it. It could be a BIA school, et cetera. Um, you know, I think one of the things to pull out here, though, is that whether you're in New Mexico and or whether you're in Vermont, and this Maryland was, you know, this is what what Maryland was getting to is, you know, that, that what, even if you have an N of, you know, your N is very low, so there's not that many African Americans relatively in Vermont. Or there's a there's a lot fewer Latino people in Vermont compared to New Mexico. But regardless of that, these these rates on the screen right now hold constant. So even if you have very very few people. Um, of color in a certain area, still they are suspended at, at you know, multiples, three, three, two, three, four times higher than, um, than their white or the, that their, than, than their white counterparts, essentially. So this is a phenomenon across the country, and it happens um, regardless of the racial makeup of a place. And certainly some places are worse than others, and, and we'll get to that in just a second. But 
Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Um, so we also know. So we also know that students with disabilities. We also know that students with disabilities are suspended um, and receive out of school suspensions three times more than non disabled students. Um, I came across a report that I was looking at earlier this week um, that was presented to the US Committee on Civil Rights by a group of Vermont uh, group of Vermonters um, who, who were who formed the Vermont State Advisory Committee. Um, and I was really struck by the testimony of the superintendent of one of our largest schools in Vermont. Uh, and his testimony was that the student body, that the um, students with disabilities comprised 18% of the studi student body, but 49% of exclusionary suspensions. So that, that means that, you know, 49% of, of those students are being, of the student population are being suspended and are not being educated. Um, and what, what I know from my experience representing students is that very often um, schools are not well, um, are, they're not able, they, they don't well um, address the behavioral and emotional needs of students. Uh, they don't always have mental health providers in the schools. Um, later, we're going to talk about police in schools. Um, we know that the resources are being spent there, that there are also consequences um, to students, but that deny students some of the other supports and services that they need. Um, and so if kids are acting out to the point where they need to be, their, their behavior needs to be addressed, then uh, then there, the school districts have an obligation, and we'll talk about this later too when we talk about special education, that school districts have an obligation to address those behaviors. And they need to address them in a way that um, enables students to learn and enables the, enable them to be aware of what they're doing uh, to, when they can be, um, it really d depending on what the nature of their disability is, so that, that uh, they can learn um, and be, be better able to stay in the school environment and learn. Yeah, and Did often you want to say something on that, see, Matt? Yeah, um, often what I would see um, with my clients is, you know, they would, I think whether whether it's unconscious bias you're talking about or whether it's um, whether it's sort of just a reaction against, um, you know, kids being kids essentially. Regardless, what 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 the what some school people what the people punishing my clients would see would be a student acting out and. Um, they would sort of stop, they, they would sort of get hung up in this criminal justice framework of, you, you know right from wrong, and you did wrong, and therefore we punish you, you know, and, and this paradigm has existed for quite, quite some time, um, you know, and underlies our criminal justice system and has really seeped its way into schools. And, you know, I think with, when I came to this work, you know, I, 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 I had worked, I was a teacher, you know, and then I, I went to law school and I, I had been to IEPs before and I had, I had, you know, students with disabilities in my class and I had, you know, uh, taught using accommodations and modifications. And I, I knew something about disability, but I think the extent to which disability um, was something that was crucial to understand, for, for me to understand in doing this work, and also for me to help the, the various systems in which I work, the judge, the opposing parties, the schools, you know, um, to understand was the, was the importance of disability in, in behavioral issues in school. And there's so, there's such a high prevalence, it's complicated, right? But there's such a high prevalence of undetected disability and people assuming things about kids that um, that are better explained in terms of disability than, than any other way. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the themes of this presentation is to make sure that you all walk away understanding the the, the centrality of, of, um, of disability in perceiving the, the, the racial justice, the, the racial issues in the school to prison pipeline, the racial issues in public school discipline um, that, that we're talking about here. These two things run together and they are intersectional. Um, we, we talk about so intersectionality I, a lot. Yes, yeah, sorry. But, but we don't usually talk about it with disability, between disability and race. No, we don't. But I wanted to add something that you said, because I think this is really important when you think about students with disabilities. As you said, that when kids do wrong, they know wrong. And 
what we know about kids with disabilities. If you, for example, have uh, attention deficit disorder and you have impulse control, um, then you may know that there's a consequence, but your disability is interfering with your ability to um, uh, to adjust your behavior in that moment. And so it's, um, so then we punish kids instead of teaching kids how to manage that. Um, and there are many ways, schools have a lot of tools where they can do that. This is not rocket science. This is research that's been around for years. Um, it's really, to some degree, you mentioned bias, and to some degree, what we, what we don't think is, going back to the idea of intersectionality, is that we, we do have a bias against kids with disabilities against people with disabilities. So next slide. So I guess this is a good intro to the intersectionality between race and disability. So um, what we know about um, students with disabilities who are also students of color, that 23% um, of black students with disabilities received at least one out of school suspension. 20.1% of the American, Native American students with disabilities le, re, receive at least one out of school suspension. 18% of Hispanic students with disabilities are suspended. Um, I came across this statistic, statistic, which I thought was interesting, is that uh, Hispanic students compared to white students in terms of their suspension for the first offense uh, was suspended at, at, white, at a rate of two, two times that of their white peers. Um, and only 8.4% of white students with disabilities nationwide received at least one out of school suspension. So again, this just kind of describes the scope of the problem that we're talking about. Um, and that for kids with disabilities who also happen to be kids of color, the consequences um, are, are greater. Matt, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I think we can move to the next slide. Thanks. So this is really just more of some of the same statistics of um, who are at the highest risk for um, exclusionary discipline, um, and that is students of color with disabilities. Um, it's particularly high for students of color who have Two, who are of two or more races and have a disability. It's 20, oh, over 25, 25.5%. Um, and this was a statistics that I found really quite shocking is that one in four boys of color, and I believe the statistic actually said black boys with disabilities um, are served by under the IDEA, which is the, which we'll talk about later, which is the um, education the law that, that ensures that kids with disabilities have access to an education, and that one in five girls, so actually more girls of color with dis, um, are identified as having disabilities. So that kind of goes to the intersectionality of, of um, and Matt, Matthew and I talked about this a little bit earlier, about the over-identification of kids with disabilities, like over-identification and under-identification. So here we have an over-identification if we're talking about one in four. Um, or one in five, um, and that's concerning. And then, Matt, I'm going to let you talk about what you mean by the under-identification of students of color. Well, in you know, often what I would see, it's sort of what I was speaking about before. You know, I would see, I would have a, a client call me, and you know, they would have been suspended from school, and the parents want help. Um, and you know, when I when I would read through the records, you know, it's always a records issue. When when I would read through the records, you know, the, the child would be reading, um, or the young person would be reading, you know, three, four, five um, grade levels behind, and um, you know, but but the school had not taken action. Um, you, you know, that's a, a there's something called child fine, which basically says that schools can't sort of throw up their hands and say, oh, we had no idea this was a child with a disability. If if there's a warning sign, like somebody reading way behind grade level. Um, there's an affirmative obligation on, on behalf of schools and, and school districts to identify to that child, to evaluate and identify that child if if he or she needs um, needs special education. And so, you know, often this would not happen until there would be a a um, a moment of crisis whereby, and, and then the school would sort of blame the kid and say, "You acted up. You threw a chair. You got in a fight. 
um, therefore you're suspended, right? So instead of offering, instead of doing the opposite, which is offering more services and understanding how the school could serve the student better, it would sort of be put right back onto, onto the kid. And, mm -hmm. you know, blaming the kid is just not helpful and nor is blaming the parents. And that's, those are the two sort of primary thing, um, primary, um, the primary tools used by people who I think aren't willing to face the complexity of educating young people and the complexity of mental health and, um, and disability. So I'll just leave it there. A <laughs> um, lot more to come and, and I think we need to maybe pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so uh, next slide, please, thanks. So this is, this is just an interesting map. Um, it's, it's, you know, the, the header, it's a little bit hard to see. It says percent of black students who have received one or more out of school suspensions by district. And basically the darker, the darker areas are districts where um, students receive more discipline, more out of school suspension. And, you know, you can see it's, 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 it's really interesting, you know, the variance here, the deep South, um, perhaps unsurprisingly has a lot of dark blue on it, but, but so does Nevada. And so does the Northern tip of, of Alaska where the N I'm sure is quite low. Um, and so does a lot of places in the north and, and Vermont, Vermont has even a dark speck up there that you can see. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about the south is that, you know, some of you may or may not know that there's 19 states in which corporal punishment of, of uh, kids in school is still legal. So if you overlay the map of corporal punishment, um, unsurprisingly, it, 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 it looks a lot like this, this, these dark blue areas in the south. Um, you know, New Mexico ban only banned corporal punishment, I think, in 2005, partly as a result of, of my or, uh, former organization, um, you know, lobbying and, and changing the law. And, you know, but in 19 states, you know, a principal can can hit a kid, can, um, you know, do things to a kid that we would potentially remove a child from a home um, over if the parent did it. Um, and that's that's obviously cultural. And, you know, there's some people that say, yes, hit my kid, of course. Um, but, you know, from my perspective, that doesn't make it OK. And, and hitting kids is something that... Um, that has very low, um, it, it has, you know, there, there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of data about this now and, it, and it's, it's, it's shown that it's, it does not teach um, discipline. It's, it traumatizes kids essentially. So um, Marilyn, did you want to add to that? Nope. Okay, I guess I just say too, that this is really not a Democrat or Republican issue. It's really not a Democrat or Republican issue. And it's really, it might be easy to say, oh, it's the South, but really we have a lot of problems in the North. We have a lot of problems of people who are Democrats. We have a lot of problems, um, on behalf of liberals and and you know i find frankly a lot of racism in in white liberals um who want to sort of cast off um kids of color um and i think it's i think it's disturbing so um let's keep going <laughs> you don't have to comment on that Marilyn. um all right so um this is sort of a placeholder slide this is sort of a placeholder slide because we're going to be moving into a little bit um, of some long-term consequences of disciplinary exclusion and, and what does it do um to young people and sort of how does the law work here so um, if we can move to the next slide after that. Mm -hmm. So here we have, this is an interesting slide that, you know, this is sort of from each of our experience. So on the left is a statute from New Mexico and on the right is a statute from Vermont. And basically they both get at um, some of the, the consequences that you may not think about when you think about expulsion from school. So these are sort of in addition to, um, in addition to a child not physically not being in school, um, there are other consequences. And if you look at B here, what B essentially says on the left, what, what B essentially says is that if a child, say, gets expelled from one school and then moves to another school, say their family moved across the state or to a new state, um, that new, new public school in their district could say to them, um, you had some trouble at your previous school. Um, and if you look at if you look at the way this is worded, it's, it's quite vague. Um, a student's behavior in another school district um, during the preceding 12 months that is detrimental to the welfare or safety of other students or school employees. I mean, you know, you could you could get almost any kid on, on that. Um, so basically what it says is like, you know, even though you you have perhaps a state entitlement to a public education, we can deny you that even in your local district school based on your prior behavior. Um, so, you know, from my perspective, you know, that that's that's a further infringing on, on a property right to an education. And um, you know, kids, kids are, their brains are not developed and we don't have a whole bunch of slides about brain science in here, but those of you out there, I'm sure a lot of you know, know these slides, but you know, children, th their frontal lobes are, are not fully developed. They have trouble making decisions. They, um, they, they, they have trouble considering the long-term consequences of their behavior and they're kids, right? And so they they make a lot of mistakes. And, you know, what I would always try to do is, 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 is 
make it so that systems would say, yes, we're, we are going to give you another chance, right? Yes, we are. And, 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 and in doing that, we're going to educate you, right? And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to give you the tools you need not to do it again, but we're not going to just going to punish you. So Marilyn. So the second half of the slide is Vermont's version of the New Mexico statute that Matthew was just talking about. So similarities, but a few differences. So in Vermont, a student, can, uh, student may be expelled um, for up to the remainder of the school year or 90 days, whichever is longer for misconduct. And the statute does refer to certain kinds of misconduct um, by which a student can be uh, suspended or expelled. Um, there is also um, superintendent or principal has some discretion relative to that with any of the, the factors. Um, and that includes, you know, um, uh, drug use, um, other kinds of, you know, misconduct on school grounds. And similarly, in to New Mexico, if a student transfers from one school to another after they've been expelled, the new school can choose to continuous suspension or expulsion, but they're not required to do so. I don't see very many instances where kids are expelled that they're um, able to enroll in another public school. Vermont has both um, public schools and independent schools um, for, you know, that, but some of the larger independent schools tend to be um, sort of de facto public schools. So there are a lot of kids who are enrolled in both public and independent schools in Vermont. And in terms of thinking about education, um, schools are encouraged under the statute um, and are authorized to provide an education to kids who are suspended or expelled, but they're not required to do so. And, you know, just to sort of to illustrate a little bit about, you know, what what are the infractions that result in an expulsion? And I can, you know, one of the students that we represented recently was a student um, who was called into the principal's office, um, escorted there by the school resource officer after the student was tardy getting to school and was hanging around the uh, across the street from where the school building was and the school resource officer escorted the student into the into the administrator's office and they dumped out the student's backpack and using a piece of tape they managed to um, pick up a few traces of marijuana so the student was expelled um, had a hearing before the school board and was expelled for the remainder of the school year because of um, traces of marijuana this was actually the student's um, second expulsion for a drug-related offense. Um, and during that period of time, the student essentially lost, um, you know, the equivalent of two full semesters of a high school education. So next slide. So, you know, why are we talking about suspension and expulsion? You know, what it really does it mean? We can, you know, we know the expulsion means that you get kicked out, but but what are the consequences to this, right? And the, the consequences are really lifetime consequences. Uh, there's lots of research out there, and some of the research that we've pulled together is, um, some of it is listed there, the sources of it, but there was a study done in, in, uh, by the Civil Rights Project of UCLA, UCLA that students who are suspended one time in the ninth grade have a two are two times more likely to drop out of school. So if they're suspended one time in the ninth grade, they're more likely to drop out of school. That's a pretty shocking statistic. We also know that disciplinary removal increases threefold the likelihood that that student will have contact with the juvenile justice system. There is a strong correlation between dropout rates and the likelihood of incarceration, both um, as juveniles and later as adults. And there is a strong correlation between dropout rates and higher poverty rates as an adult. Um, so the consequences are not, uh, the consequences are significant to that individual student who is removed from the educational environment. Matt, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that. No, I think we should keep it moving. Thanks. You did a, you did a great job. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, freedom detained, again, this is just going over some of the um, 
the statistics, but so, you know, by race, um, looking at black students, they uh, represent 16% of the student enrollment, and yet 25%, uh, 27% and 31% uh, respectively are referred to either law enforcement or subjected to school related arrest. So we're talking, you know, in, in addition to suspension, which means removal for what, up to 10 days, maybe longer, uh, but you're allowed to come back at some point, presumably. Expulsion means you may be gone for the remainder of the school year. But um, arrest or referral to law enforcement means that you now are facing uh, the consequences of the juvenile justice system. Uh, that may mean for some students diversion, um, but for some students that could be incarceration. So, we're, you know, we are to as to such to a pretty significant degree here, I think, talking about um, racial bias. Um, Native American students, as I said earlier, represent a very small percentage of the population, and yet they have a um, rel to that relative to that number have a fairly high number of referral to law enforcement or arrest. Hispanic students uh, represent 24.5 percent of the population, um, and their uh, referral rate is. Um, pretty comparable to that of black students, um, although black students do have a higher arrest rate. And by comparison, students with disabilities, which have a 13 percent and uh, or th represent 13 percent of students, um, have a 25 percent rate of referral to law enforcement and or arrest. Um, you know, so I represented a student last year, a 16 year old student who um, was who has a disability and um, actually in we'll talk a little bit about this later in terms of restorative justice but had a provision in the students IEP that when there were behavioral issues uh, the school's response to that would be a, a referral to restorative justice and the uh, school resource officer either was unaware or chose to ignore that and uh, the student was um, ultimately removed from the school and um, the police officer came later that day and served him with an arrest warrant. So now he is facing um, consequences in juvenile court. Um, next slide. Okay, you know, I, I think you guys probably have uh, enough stats in front of you now, but this one, this one I think just encapsulates the issue here, which is that, you know, as Marilyn was just saying, ultimately what happens when young people with who need serious educational and um, you know, disability and mental health supports don't get that help, they often wind up in juvenile detention. And ironically, some of my clients got some of the best mental health services they've ever gotten when they were locked up for a year or two years or even sometimes longer. And these are, these are students under, under 18. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a shame. And that's not, it's, it's you know, it's, 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 it's costly in terms of dollars, but it's also just costly in terms of lives. Um, and you know what we need to be doing is giving these, raising this thirty-seven percent and lowering the eighty-five, right? Getting kids the services they need easier. No, nobody should want these kids to end up incarcerated, and they should not be getting their best mental health services of their entire life um, when they're locked up. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, again, we just to go back to the intersectionality here. You know, there's I represent a lot of kids in the child dependency system who had education, they had disability issues, education issues, and then juvenile justice issues on, um, as a result of not getting the help they needed. So um, these things come together. So next slide. So when we were thinking about preparing this, you know, we really started thinking about education as a civil right. And you've heard Matthew refer to uh, education as a property right. Um, and there, as I was pulling together the slide, I thought it was kind of interesting that, you know, the, the the time periods here, but but um, these are pieces of uh, federal legislation that all refer to educational rights of of, of students. So Title IV uh, of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 protects students from discrimination based on race and other areas, not exclusively race, race, religion, ethnicity, and all academic areas. So this is the provision that prohibits discrimination in school settings. Um, Section 504 of the Civil Rights Act of 1973 prohibits discrimination on the basis of dis disability by recipients of federal funds. Um, that includes public schools. Uh, sec Section 504 is designed to ensure that students with disabilities have equal access to an education. 
um, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, which came about um, in 1974, really because kids with disabilities across the country um, were being denied an education. Uh, they, you know, if you look at the the uh, preamble to the to the legislation, you know, there's all kinds of um, facts that had been revealed about kids who were being warehoused and not being provided with an education. Um, my father's sister was denied an education. She had an intellectual disability and was sent home on her first day of first grade because the, um, the schools realized that she uh, uh, had an intellectual disability and she, she never returned to school her entire life. So this was a really important piece of civil rights legislation. And it's also an educational ed piece of legislation and it's the um, predecessor of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So it not only is a civil right in that it, it entitles students with disabilities to an education, but then it also ensures the uh, appropriate provision of that education. And of course, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is you know almost 20 years later, uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in services, programs, and activities. I sort of just pulled the, that piece out that was relative to Title II, which is the um, places of public, uh, not places of public accommodation, public entities. Um, there's also the ADA prohibits discrimination in employment as well as um, uh, places of public accommodation. So next slide. So this slide is really just, you know, as we've talked quite a little bit about disability, but that is really where my area of expertise lies. And, and Matthew also has a fair amount of experience in representing uh, kids with disabilities. But we just wanted to sort of put in context that, you know, People with disabilities represent um, 40.6 million Americans, and that 7.1 million students have um, have disabilities. So that's really think well. All we really need to say on that on that subject. Next slide. Yeah, and so um, th this um, you know we're not going to go through each of these, but. You know, the IDEA, what is now the IDEA, is a very powerful um, and extensive, I actually brought my regs book here as a little prop. You know, it is quite thick. These are the regs for the IDEA. Um, it, is, it is a powerful civil rights um, law um, protecting the right of, of young people to, with disabilities to an education. And, um, you know, I think in the interest of time, we're going to move a little faster here. But if you have questions about the IDEA, um, please let us know. So next slide. Um, and, you know, just something to highlight, this is sort of the standard, the gold standard for the IDEA is a free and appropriate public education. And what that means is the subject of you know, much litigation in many cases. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly free as in no cost. It's um, certainly public. Um, it's in a public school environment and it's appropriate. And, you know, as, as the slide says, you know, there's these, these Rowley and Andrew F are, two, are the two sort of biggest Supreme Court cases um, about what the standard um, means. So next slide, please. Oh, sorry, Madeline, did you want to answer that? No, I just, I threw that slide in there just to, to articulate the standard of a recent uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision as to what the standard is to, as measuring what is or is not appropriate. And, and the under F decision uh, said, which was a U.S. Supreme Court decision told says schools must offer reason and education reasonably be calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances, and that overruled the the then standard. I believe it was in the Tenth Circuit um, that kids with disabilities were entitled to um, a de minimis education. So, um, in the Second Circuit, where, where Vermont is, uh, Andrew F. Um, doesn't really change the landscape a whole lot. We were already um, on par with that. So we're going to breeze through these. Yes, Go my ahead. Fair, <laughs> my fair 10th circuit and, and Justice Gorsuch yeah. you know, emerges from, from the 10th circuit and my uh, friend appeared in front of him when he was in the 10th circuit, but that's, that's another story for another day. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, here are the categories of, for, in the IDEA, you know, it covers a lot of different um, disabilities and these categories become important when you're, when you're litigating and advocating. Um, and this, it gets very technical, very fast, but, um, you know, these are here as a, as a placeholder. Um, next slide, please. 
So here are some really important issues in terms of school discipline in the IDEA. You know, the, the big principles, and these are enshrined in, in the statute and the regs, you know, we do not punish children for conduct they cannot help. And even if punishment is permissible, we do not withhold necessary services. So if you are expelled from a school and you have an IEP, in theory, you are still entitled to FAPE, a free and appropriate public education. The reality of that can look, you know, can vary widely in terms of, you know, who you are, who's advocating for you, what the school district looks like, the geography, et cetera. But the overall concept is that, you know, an education is not withheld from you. Um, on the flip side, if you don't have a disability or an identified disability, or you're not at least, um, you, you know, potentially, you don't have a potential disability, um, you, you are entitled to, to zilch, as we sort of talked about before. And so a school district, you know, as, as that law said in Vermont, is, you know, encouraged to, to offer you something, but you can have zero education. Um, and that can be incredibly detrimental, as, as we've talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some other technical rules here which protect children. You know, I think for right now, it's important just to understand that there is a big framework. Thanks, Sam. Next slide. Thank you. Um, and, and this slide is about sort of informal ways that's that that outside of the IDEA that, you know, or outside of formal discipline um, uh, procedure that students are sort of kicked out or pushed out of school. These are all um, kind of soft, um, they're soft, soft techniques in the sense that they're not like, um, that they're not taking a student to a hearing to say you're officially um, expelled or suspended. These sort of rely on making school difficult for a student. Um, and then the student kind of quote unquote voluntarily withdraws. Um, and, you know, again, this gets to, I don't want it to make it sound like, you know, there's like an, a meeting of a bunch of school officials and they're like, how can we push this kid out? You know, I think that's not often how it happens, but the sum total of the, um, the, the climate that most students with disabilities, especially students of color with disabilities face, that that is the result. Marilyn, do you wanna? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, next slide. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Um, and so, oh yeah, Marilyn, so this was you. Oh, okay. So, um, so talking about students with disabilities, um, I found a statistic that I did not incorporate into the slides, but um, of the, the, the kids that have disabilities, the largest disability category is students with a specific learning disability. And that um, often means um, a reading disability. That's just one of the, you know, categories within that category. Um, so it's a it's important because um, students who can't read are more likely to get in trouble. Um, and students who get in trouble trouble are more likely to not learn to read, right? So if you're excluded from the classroom, you're not learning. Um, uh, what we know is we said earlier about 15 to 20 percent of the population um, have a language based or have a disability. This is specific to language based disability and most of those have dyslexia. Um, 74% of the children who are poor readers in third grade remain poor readers in ninth grade. This, these statistics are really um, are reflective in my practice. I see this a lot. I see a lot of middle school kids who are in fifth, sixth, seventh grade who are reading at first and second grade levels. I see early high school kids who are reading at third grade levels. And I'm representing them not necessarily because they're not getting the education, the academic supports that they need, but because of behavioral issues, right? So they, they're being disciplined um, because, uh, because, and um, because they violated a school rule or they, their behavior becomes challenging. And what we find out very often is that these are kids who also don't read. So there's, and there's also been some studies on that is that we find that the older, that if you're not reading by third grade, the reality is, is that you're going to get farther and farther and farther behind. And then, you, then we see a lot of kids start having social emotional problems because um, for all the reasons, I'm stupid, I can't read, I can't keep up. And, and so all of that plays into their behavior in the classroom. If they are frustrated because they're not getting it, then that's going to contribute to their behavior in the classroom. So it is important um, aspect. Is there something you wanted to add about that, Matthew? Yeah. Um, yeah, just, um, you know, what manifests on the outside is a behavior problem, but what might really be going on is a reading problem. And I think that connection is not often made um, for young people in school. Um, and that's, that's what's overlooked when you start to treat a child as a 
as a, you know, when you when you utilize sort of criminal justice concepts in education. Um, and, you know, same with you, Marilyn, my clients, you know, almost all of my clients who were incarcerated had extreme troubles reading. And it was, um, you know, it's it's just a notable fact that, that you know, uh -huh. reading is, it's these things go hand in hand. This double-edged sword is, is, is incredibly powerful. So next slide, please. Okay, so this I'm gonna go through fast and some of you probably know this already, but you know, these, the discipline, discipline in schools extends to very young children, um, children, you know, six, five, four, even three. Um, and, you know, and depending on where you live and, and you know, what, how you present and, you know, your disability and your life story, um, you could be easily a five-year-old let out of a classroom in handcuffs. Um, that happens all over the country. It happens more often than you might think. Um, and, you know, this is just incredibly damaging. It's damaging to teachers. It's damaging to, obviously, the kids. It's damaging to the families. Um, and, um, you know, and it, it's particularly prevalent, if you could go to the next slide. Um, um, so if you see the stat here, 48% of preschool children suspended more than once are black, um, which is just a shocking statistic. Um, and, you know, oh, the other thing I was going to say is about this labeling. You know, there's labeling, there's external labeling on kids. And then when, it, when a child gets older, like some of the teenagers that I would work with, then they would sort of self, by that time, they would often self-label. And so they would, like Marilyn said, they would be the ones saying, I, I, I just don't get it. I can't learn, um, you know, and, and sort of that would be a reinforcing cycle that was incredibly negative and hard to break. And it starts at a very young age. Um, if we could just go to one more slide and Marilyn, don't worry, I'll give you a chance to jump in here, but um, That's okay. so at the bottom here, um, oh, there's a letter missing somehow that fell off at the end, but it's, you know, the three Bs, um, this is from a Yale study and the three B, the three Bs were the, the, um, the biggest sort of danger factors in, um, in young children in preschool being disciplined. And that's being a boy being black and being big, physically big. And, you know, I'll just say personally, um, I have a four-year-old um, who is very big and he is a boy. Um, he's not black. Um, and I think a lot about how things would be different for him if he, if he, his skin color was darker, um, you know, and if, or if we lived in a, in a different place or both, and if we lived in a different place, both things. And, um, you know, it's, it's disturbing and it's, it's partly what propels me in this, in this work, um, you know, is, is the privilege that I see and, um, you know, knowing that that's not extended to everybody and um, it's, it's upsetting. So Marilyn, does you want to mm -hmm. anything? No, I just would briefly echo what you said is that the consequences of um, expulsion on very young children is very harmful, but it is it, it's just always shocking to me when you think about children as young as four, five, and six who are being expelled from school or being schooled from preschool yeah. program. Yeah, thanks. And Marilyn, I don't know, I would propose maybe since we, we're running out of time that we should sort of, I yeah. can do a quick, we should just sort of jump to the part about police and schools and kind of what's next. Um, okay, okay. If, if that, that's okay with you, is that okay with you? Sure, that's great. So if you could, I'll just, we'll just go through these slides real quick and I'll just cover the big themes, but could you go to the next slide, please? Um, so this is, this next section is about discretionary treatment and I'll just say the most racist, the most racist thing is the benefit of the doubt. That's that's a little catchphrase that it, that sort of resonates with me. Um, next, please. Uh, we'll skip that. Next, please. <laughs> Gospi Lopez, interesting case. We're not going to talk about it. It deals with school exclusion. Um, definitely look at it if you're interested in this work. Um, next, please. I think if we could go to, um, if we could go to slide, let's see, go to slide 37, please. Thank so you. there's a strong connection between having police in schools and suspension and expulsion rates. Um, and of course, arrest um, and referral to law enforcement rates. So, um, the Advancement Project is a, a civil rights, multiracial civil rights group that has done uh, a lot of research in this. And, you know, I, I love this quote that the presence of police in schools threatens student safety and denies students the opportunity to learn. 
because it leads to criminalization for age appropriate behaviors. And I think it's really important when we think about police and schools and we think it, as lay people and we think how um, that they must be providing, they must be making schools safer. What has happened actually is that as schools have, as, as we've put more and more police in schools, there has been a corresponding increase in student arrests and um, student ex uh, ex removal for, for, for disciplinary exclusion. So the research, so many people are researching this and the research is, is demonstrating that there is no evidence that police um, in schools make schools safer. Um, and there is also no empirical evidence that supports the claim that the continued deployment of police in schools prevent mass shootings. So this research is still, um, is actually still being done relative to that relationship between we need to have cops in schools because of school shootings, but we do know that school shootings are very rare. We also know that more students um, die from suicide and um, outside of school and um, there are higher homicide rates for students outside of school than there are for students in school. Um, and then what we also know is that the consequence of having police in schools is significant. So next slide, please. So we think it's really important to, to change the conversation, right? So in, instead of thinking about um, what we need to do why we need police. If we start thinking about things that we can do to correct the problems, um, and, and there are things that if schools can be intentional about these things, then, then actually studies will show that, there, that you will see an, in, an improvement in school climate, safety, and order on campus, um, keeps students engaged in learning, and increases chances for lifelong success. Next slide. Changing the environment. What we know is that studies show that positive behavioral interventions can help change the climate. Uh, Non-punitive response protocols change the climate. Restorative justice practices change the climate. Um, and also when staff are trained um, in these areas, then that also can make a big difference. And so we can move from a school to prison pipeline where kids are actually um, provided with an education and an environment that encourages learning. And if I could just jump Next in and slide. shout out the VLS restorative, yeah. restorative justice program, um, because, you know, part of this work is training, you know, leaders who will carry out these practices. And, and that's what we're doing at VLS. So um, Bobby and Stephanie and everybody else in the program, um, thanks for the work you do. And, you know, also the center on, um, on the, now I'm forgetting the name, <laughs> on, on, uh, justice reform. Um, you know, you, you guys are, are creating the next generation of leaders who can do this work. So that's important. Next slide, yeah, yeah, thanks. So, um, you know, we're, we're sort of out of time and I know we breezed through some of that, you know, there's so many angles to this. Um, and, you know, I think there's probably a lot of ideas out there, you know, it's, I, it's, it's weird because Marilyn and I can't see you and nor do we know how many of you there are, um, but I'm sure there's a lot of uh, brilliant people out there doing incredible work and a lot of expertise and, um, you know, uh, it takes a community to do this work. So I'll just say also as an advertisement, you know, this work does not, it does not make you rich, um, but it is, it does make you rich in love and it's very rewarding. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard work, but it is so, um, it is so powerful. And, and for me, it's really about working with, with the kids and just being, even in, even when they're in jail, you know, just being a human face for them. Um, you know, it's, it's something that, uh, that I think, you know, it makes being a lawyer, it, it's, it makes being a lawyer even more powerful. So I'll just leave it at that. Marilyn, did you want to say any parting words before we uh, turn it back over? No, I would agree. It is, it's very powerful. It's very meaningful work. Um, and certainly we can use more people who are dedicated to pursuing the civil rights of all people in this country. So uh, contact us, feel free to call. I do answer, I do answer phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> As Matthew knows. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. And thank you, Marilyn. Thanks for being here. You're welcome.
All right. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for um, this very insightful conversation. Um, one of the questions asked whether uh, this session was going to be recorded. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that, yes, this session is being recorded and it will be made available um, very shortly. And you can access it on our um, Vermont Law School Facebook page in addition to our live stream site. Um, so I have tons of questions and I'm going to use a uh, moderator's discretion to be able to um, ask my questions first. Um, as a person who grew up in a public school um, that had police and hall monitors and we got our bags searched every morning and we had metal detectors and things of that nature, um, most urban schools have urban schools have a lot of those elements um, and compared to a lot um, of their white counterpart institutions. So when it's pretty undeniable fact that drugs and other paraphernalia that um, these searches are trying to avoid are not exclusively found within these schools. So what are your thoughts on some of these measures that have been um, put in place predominantly in um, more settings that have um, higher higher amounts of students of color versus um, white schools. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I, th I mean, personally, as a you know, as a, a as a white person who uh, grew up in a white community and um, uh, the school district that my children went to is 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 predominantly white. Um, the fact that they even have surveillance cameras drives me crazy um, and did when my when my kids were attending. Um, it, you're absolutely right. The, the schools in urban areas um, have become scary places. Um, looking at on the outside looking in, I can't imagine being on the inside looking out. Um, certainly it, the, it's, um, you know, it, it's I think it's connected to to the um, the, the greater use of police in our country, right, from the 90s, and, and we're seeing the effects of that now, of the uh, criminalization of people of color, and that's been brought into our school system. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think it's alarming that school, the, where, where children of color are going is um, fortresses uh, or prisons, and white kids, um, maybe even some of the same communities or nearby communities, are not experiencing that same thing. I can't imagine the effect it has on their ability to learn. So I don't know if that yeah, really answers the I question, mean, guess, but uh, that always shocks me. <laughs> it's a big question. I mean, I think the it, that's a manifestation of, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's racism. It's structural racism. It's um, you know, it's yeah. it's a symptom of um, the swirling system, uh, sort of effects of historical injustice in this country. And you know, there's there's lots of ways you could sort of justify it. Um, but really, I, I you know, I guess I would point it back to uh, uh, it being about, you know, it's 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 also about a low quality education, and it's you know the the manifestation of the police state in schools. Um, you know, it criminalizes kids, and it and it. And it prevents them from getting a high quality education. And, and one of the slides that we breezed over, which I was just trying to find and, and couldn't, um, basically shows that there's social science data that shows that, you know, there's often the justification for these measures is we have to get, we have to root out the crime and the problem kids so that the other kids, the good kids can learn. Um, and, you know, what this social science data shows is that that's not true. In fact, when you have a school that is very, um, it has a, a very punitive disciplinary climate. It actually, it, it actually, it affects morale of all students, including the non-criminal, non-criminal students. Um, there's also, you know, there's statistics that show that something like 90% of children will have committed a, um, you know, will, will have engaged in behavior that would be deemed a, a criminal offense through, you know, at one time in their high school career. I mean, I, I, you know, I'll raise my hand. I mean, I, you know, who out there did not do something in high school that was not against the law? And so, you know, there, there's different ways of justifying this, but what it comes down to is, you know, I think this, this historical structural racism and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard because all of these, you know, it, it's, it swirls in terms of low funding of, you know, low, low funding of schools, low, low budgets, um, you know, police presence, um, teachers lacking training and having low morale, um, you know, and a, and a punitive disciplinary climate. And then, and that's only what students are facing in school. There's all kinds of things they're facing outside of school in their communities that, you know, when I was teaching, 
um, you know, one of the reasons I went to law school is students would come to me and I just realized that what they were really dealing with had absolutely nothing to do with, what, with whether I could explain, you know, um, something about the Civil War to them. It, it had to do with, you know, whether they eaten that day or, um, you know, some, some trauma that they'd suffered or, um, you know, even physically being in the classroom was a challenge. And so when police are there, it, it, it exacerbates all of those factors and uh, uh -huh. it's not a good situation. Thank you. Um, I had been yeah, I, I, that's so that's so right. Um, it, it is a symptom of systemic racism and systemic oppression. Mm -hmm. um, and so along those same lines, um, we've seen many statistics that state that often when school resource officers are removed from schools, there tends to be a heightened amount of student arrests when teachers, uh, because teachers will simply just call 911 when uh, they can't de-escalate a situation. So uh, first, what are some alternative sources that you, or resources that you suggest? And second, are there strategies to change district policies to remove um, school resource officers from schools? Marilyn, this seems right up your alley. All right, well, I'll, I'll start with the latter part first. Um, well, for example, in Vermont, um, when there became all of the, um, protests this summer against racial injustice, uh, people in Vermont were also paying attention, right? And um, one of my co my former colleagues had, had prepared a report um, about five years ago, Jay Diaz, who's now a staff attorney with the ACLU, uh, entitled Kicked Out. And it, it addresses these issues and, and their impact, particularly in Vermont. Um, and we used some of those resources and um, approached school boards. We, we you know, wrote a letter to, this, to every school board and its superintendent in the state and said, this is the time we want you to re remove police from the schools. And you'll see that across the country, people are coming forward and, say, and demanding the removal of, of police from schools. I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of what you've talked about in terms of there being higher, that, that more teachers are calling the police. As, a, as an administrator, I would find that very problematic. If the administration uh, directed by the school board is going to remove police from the schools, then the, then the administration has a an obligation to ensure that they work on changing the climate and in the school, right? And, and we can use restorative justice practices. There are very good programs out there. It's easy to find that. It's about changing the climate within the school, and that's got to start at with every individual who works in that school, the bus driver, the cafeteria workers, the paraeducators, the staff secretaries, the teachers, all have to be educated about these issues and, and um, learn how to deal with appropriate behavioral interventions. You know, uh, and for very serious behaviors, we may talk about functional behavioral assessments, but but if you implement a positive behavioral intervention system in your school and you implement it with fidelity, then you are going to see a change in school climate. And, and the kinds of concerns that you're talking about of teachers calling the police are, you know, they became significantly lessened because the climate has changed. And it has a positive effect of improving outcomes for kids. We also know that when we improve school climate through these non-punitive measures, that, that students' academic scores actually increase. We know they learn better when they are in an environment that encourages them to learn and doesn't, you know, treat them like they're in um, prisons. So the first part of the question was what? <laughs> or maybe that answers the question. <laughs> um, it may answer the question um, because the, the first part was asking about um, alternative resources that you might suggest. Um, and so you mentioned restorative justice and things of that nature. So um, I think I think that, that question has been answered. Um, okay, so good. You also <laughs> Sorry, I could, I could just jump in on that. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. I would just say I would just say a couple of things. One, you know, old, good old fashioned. I don't want to sound like like a, like a lefty, you know, '60s hippie here or, or anything, but um, you know, good old fashioned organizing really does make a big difference in in school districts. And in Albuquerque, there was this group called um, Families United for Education (FUE), and it was a group of um, large. It was a, a lot of um, a lot of non non first language English speakers, so people who were you know first and second generation immigrants. Um, people who a lot of a lot of poor parents and basically it was this it was this sort of grassroots coalition of parents that organized and one of the things that they were organizing for uh, 
um, was what is commonly referred to, again, terminology is tough, but is ethnic studies, which you may have heard of. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a synonym for ethnic studies, which is a relevant education for kids, right? You know, um, a child who is in school and learning about something, uh, some, someone else's history, um, is just not engaged in the same way that a, that a, that a child who um, that a child who is getting an education that that speaks to them, you know, is engaged. And you know, the best way, as any teacher knows, to prevent to, to to ensure discipline in your classroom is not to get into power struggles and have a bunch of like punitive rules. It's to keep the students engaged, right? When I was teaching freshman English, like that was a challenge, of course. Like grammar days were were, were dreaded, but because we had a curriculum in the school where I worked that that that, that was essentially an ethnic studies curriculum, and it, and that really. Um, spoke to the students that was the most powerful thing for for keeping them engaged and if we're all learning together like isn't that the goal so i think that's that may seem kind of obvious but i think it's it's not the approach that you know i would say at least 75 percent of school districts across this country take um you know they, they have this sort of rote curriculum that is not applicable often to the students who are in the classroom um and um you know, and then I, I guess I would also say, um, oh, let me just leave. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's fine. And that's that's a perfect segue. Um, and also a great time to acknowledge that Vermont does have an ethnic studies bill um, that has objectives that require um, public schools within the next few years to start integrating more diverse perspectives into their curriculum. Um, so the state of Vermont is certainly on track to be part of uh, this movement towards a more diverse, more inclusive curriculum uh, as the standard, yeah. because that's what it should be. And can, um, I, thank you for and, Go ahead, and can I make a plug sure. too? So there, there is actually an ad hoc, ad hoc group of, of parents, students, and educators in Vermont who are, uh, we've done a couple of um, forums like this, teaching people about what does it mean to have cops in schools? The consequences of having cops in schools answers that, you know, delves into those questions of are schools really safer by having cops in schools? And then also what you can do to help organize. So we are seeing in Vermont, which I find really encouraging, a lot of parents, a lot of students coming forward and saying, we don't want police in our schools. And, and, and you know, sort of getting the organizational tools they need to go to school boards and make those demands. Um, is exciting. there a name or contact information um, associated with that committee that you can share? So it's very ad, ad hoc. I would say that the that probably the best way to reach somebody would be um, Amanda Garcia through the Human Rights Commission. I believe she is their equity and diversity coordinator. Yes, she's wonderful. Yeah, Amanda <laughs> Garcia. She's amazing. Yeah, she is. But she would be the probably the person yes. for people in Vermont to contact. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, as more schools are addressing disparities in discipline and shifting towards a more restorative justice approach, how do we provide meaningful solutions to violations of anti-harassment, anti-bullying, and anti-racism school policies for both the aggressor and those who have been harmed? Um, in other words, how can you enforce a zero tolerance policy of any sort? Well, can I take can I take that one first? Sure, I was <laughs> gonna toss you that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, first, I would say we shouldn't enforce a zero tolerance policy. Um, zero tolerance policies are um, they just they just don't reflect the reality of what it is to be a kid, a young person. And, and by young person, I'm talking about people. There's people who are at Vermont Law School right now who I would call kids, <laughs> right? Like, you know, depending on your life experience, your your brain is literally not developed and you're making you're making decisions. Um, you know, the, the common parlance, the legal term is knucklehead. Right. But, you know, it's it, whatever way you frame it, it basically means like you're not you don't have a full form. I say that with love. Course. You know, you don't have a full formed ability to, to make the best decisions. And, you know, I would represent clients again and again and again who would just make the dumbest decisions, right? Um, 16 year olds who would just, you know, not usually not literally, although it does happen, but shoot themselves in the foot, right? Proverbially, and just do stuff that's so dumb. Like they're on probation and they just, they just like violate it, you know, you know, for something really silly and small. And it's because, like, you know, the neuroscience shows us that they, they, they are not fully formed adults able to make decisions. And um, so zero tolerance policies don't recognize that. They, they, 
they criminalize, you know, what, what's the behavior of young people. And, you know, part of what restorative justice does that I think is great, and, you know, I'm not the expert on it, there's people at VLS who, who are, um, you know, is, is, it, is it, it says that we're not going to hold you accountable for your worst day. We're not going to define the rest, sorry, we're going to hold you accountable, but we're not going to base our, you know, the way we treat you for the rest of your life on, on your worst day. And, you know, if, if we each think of our own worst day, we know that even as adults, we make, I make a lot of mistakes. Um, and so then, you know, the other part of the question was, um, how do we, oh, the perpetrator, the, you know, the thing you learn too when you work in child welfare is that the line between perpetrator and victim is often not as, not as firm of a line as um, popular imagination, you know, would have us believe. Um, and, you know, often the person who is the perpetrator was a victim in a different context, which isn't to say that we just excuse behavior. But again, the good thing about restorative justice is it recognizes that and it recognizes the importance of accountability and it recognizes the importance of forgiveness. Um, and um, the school that I used to work at, as you read in my bio, uh, Ariel was called Amy Beale High School. And, you know, that's a long story, but essentially Amy Beale was murdered in South Africa. And uh, I'm going to try to say this without getting emotional. <laughs> and basically, her her parents, um, her parents, uh, not only not only you know went went before the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and um, you know forgave her her killers, but they also her mom would travel around um, with some of those people. There I go. <laughs> so anyway, restorative justice can be very powerful in, in that sense. And um, you know, zero tolerance, I think, is just it's just an outdated. Um, it's just an outdated, um, it's an outdated technique that is still used in, ma in many, many, many school districts, but is essentially we should get rid of it, <laughs> I think is, is my short answer on that. I'm just going to jump in here. It's like, we're not advocating that schools um, permit chaos, right? I mean, part of learning, part of going to school is learning how to behave as an adult and as a member of society, right? But what, what has happened is that we've we've tended to uh, to punish kids for behavior that's age appropriate, and I think, and developmentally appropriate. And I think that's a piece that we have to remember. So um, it's, imp you know, restorative justice, is, as you just described, Matthew, is a powerful tool for, for remedying those wrongs. But, you know, some kids aren't being, uh, you know, they're, they're swearing, they're angry, they're upset, they're using foul language. Is that a reason to call the police? I don't think so. Is that a reason to be expelled or suspended from school? We should be dealing with those kinds of um, age appropriate, even if they're offensive behaviors. <laughs> Zero tolerance, yeah, say you know, when you're, yeah, I mean, if you're talking about kids throwing chairs at other kids, if you're talking about violent, you know, physical disruptions of the classroom where somebody's getting hurt, those are the kind of things that, that we should be dealing with, right? But when kids are, are just dis being disruptive or whatever, those are the kinds of things that administrators have dealt with from students for generations. They didn't need to resort to police for that. Yeah, and again, the question is, what are we teaching kids when we respond with zero tolerance? You know, the, the part of education in the school is not just the, what you're learning in your books, right? It's actually like the social setting and the, and the social emotional learning that occurs. And so the adults, I think, often don't understand that they're communicating through, their, through, their, through the discipline that they're administering. And so, you know, it's incumbent upon us as educators, you know, us broadly to, to, teach, to teach kids how to not do it again. And just punitive, mm -hmm. punitiveness just doesn't work for a young kid who's not in the same you know, I, I would argue it, perhaps it doesn't work for adults either, but it certainly doesn't work for kids. It doesn't teach them. It teaches them to be punitive. It doesn't teach them to actually change their behavior. Thank you. Um, so we probably will only have time for about one more question, um, one or two maybe. Um, so the next one that we have is, do you think improving diagnosis of attention deficit or other related issues in girls sooner will help improve the statistics that you named? Um, and I guess for a little bit more context, um, mm -hmm. I, from what I understand, like statistically, um, girls tend to be diagnosed later in life than, than guys um, for some of these mental disorders, not disorders, but um, yeah. So I, I'm just, this, this question is very interesting and I'm, I'm wondering if you have any um, mm. thoughts or feedback on that. I don't know that I can speak to the diagnosis of that specific disability. Um, 
if you know if part of the question is in ter is um, should we be addressing sort of the way that attention deficit manifests itself in students, right? So the behaviors, if we're looking at behaviors, you know, we can start looking at those behaviors from early ages, right? So attention deficit might disorder might be there, you're not attending, right? You're you're easily impulsive or whatever all the other characteristics of attention deficit disorder. Um, you know, if schools are doing early interventions and if they're providing students and, and with some of the changes in the funding in Vermont in particular, we're moving to a, from a reimbursement model for special ed to a census-based funding model, the focus is going to be on multi-tiered levels of support, right? So if we're, we're really faithfully implementing that, then we're, we're, we're identifying those disabilities of kids earlier. We're getting, we're addressing their reading and their math, you know, issues. Um, so that maybe as they get into old, higher grades, there's there's less of that. Um, you know, I, I, from the medical point of view, I, I really can't answer the question of like, should they be diagnosed earlier? I, so I don't know, maybe Matthew, you have something to say more specific answer to that uh, question. I'm, I'm also not a medical doc. I'm also not a medical doctor. I mean, I think that, you know, what, what I would be fighting for often for my clients in special education cases would be a high quality evaluation. And so often what the, the poor kids of color that I was working with would, would have received was a was not that, right? It was a, you know, we, we would get to know these, these PhDs and these medical doctors who would write these um, cookie cutter evaluations and sort of sometimes they even have like the other kid's name, like still in the evaluate. I mean, anyone who's worked with kids has seen that, you know, there's the wrong kid's name is in there because they've just used a, a template. And, um, you know, so the point there is, is it's not, you know, our job as attorneys in the, in the special ed context is to ensure that there is a high quality evaluation of what a young person is dealing with, because often it is challenging to understand what's going on. I mean, certainly I would not walk into every room and I would meet a student and say, you're complex and interesting, but I don't know how to put a medical or, or a diagnosis on that. And I'm not licensed to do that. Um, but, you know, part of what I developed over time was a sort of proverbial Rolodex full of actual high quality evaluators and what we'd often be um, pushing for and sometimes settling for would be that high quality evaluation. And sometimes that was the best we could do. And often that would though set that young person up for, um, it, it would both protect them under the law because of certain due process protections and it would also set them up for some higher quality remedies and some better services going forward. Because what poor kids often get is, um, at least in New Mexico, is um, is poor services essentially. So, you know, I think that specific issue I don't have a lot of technical knowledge about. I think there's a there's a complication. You don't want to over medicate somebody too young, of course, and you know, that that's a medical issue and that's an important issue. But a kid who clearly has and um, you know a, a significant you know something like um, epilepsy or something like autism or you know especially serious issues like that diagnosing young um, or, or Tourette's syndrome, right? Um, epilepsy maybe isn't the best example. Tourette's syndrome or, or um, you know, or, or autism or, you know, intellectual disability is a huge one. You know, th those, those significant um, issues need to be sussed out very early. There's a funny thing with ADHD where like it's geographically determined, like, like your diagnosis, like it's much more diagnosed in the Northeast um, of the country, which doesn't make any sense. And it's obviously a cultural issue, not a medical issue. So um, it, it's complex. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you. We, we may have time for just one more question. Uh, so, no, we were uh, so fast answering that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, can, can you speak to the uses or failures in using manifest determination meetings for students with identified disabilities? Well, uh, Matthew probably has a lot to say on this too. Is you know, I think it really depends, <laughs> right? Well, <laughs> it really depends. Um, it depends on the school district to some degree. It depends on how carefully they follow the law. Um, I've seen good manifestation determinations. Um, I've seen better ones when attorneys show up. Um, manifestation determinations are important for people who don't know what they are. So if a student with a disability is removed from school or the, or the plan is to remove them from, from school, to suspend them for more than 10 days, then they are entitled to have what's called a manifestation determination. And the purpose of that is to look at whether or not the behavior that's causing the disciplinary action is related to the student's disability. And what I have seen and when I've challenged that is that very often 
you know, we may look at the only part of the student's disability, right? So a student may have a learning disability. We're going to say, well, when they, um, you know, jumped up and, you know, knocked something over, was that related, related to a learning disability? No, but it may have been related to their attention deficit disorder, right? And so, I mean, I think that it's important for, it's an important tool. A manifestation determination is an important tool for when you're talking about a discipline of children with disabilities is really looking at the whole student and really going through and answering the questions. Is the IEP effective? Is the behavior a manifestation of the student's disability? You really need to suss that out and make that determination. Um, and then if it is, then you need to follow the steps, right? You get more services for the kids. You not do another evaluation and maybe you change you, and you change the way you discipline the kid, right? You no longer can suspend the child, um, but you can address the child's underlying behaviors, which is what schools are all about. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, some of my most frustrating moments as an attorney were in manifestation determination reviews and disciplinary hearings at schools. Um, it can be a very powerful tool. It can be, um, it can feel useless at times. You know, I think just to echo what Marilyn was saying, which I think is exactly right. Um, you know, a, a child, for example, who's struggling to read will often have behavioral issues and sometimes that behavioral issue will come up when the teacher says you know roberto can you read in front of the whole class please right like and the teacher may the teacher probably doesn't know what they've done but that kid might do everything he can to avoid that situation and sometimes that's behavioral there's also just general frustration i mean there's, strat there's strategic avoidance and then there's sort of just frustration that kids with disabilities and um, and kids that have been discriminated against repeatedly um, for whatever reason experience. And the problem at an MDR is, is, is what Marilyn said, you know, like how many dots do you get to connect in the MDR? And you know, there's case law on this and it's a technical issue. But, um, you know, from my perspective, you should be able to connect the dots and look at the whole child. Um, and, you know, the law allows for that to some extent. Um, but there's when you're dealing with all of these issues, you know, trauma, you know, did the kid eat that day? You know, the, is the, does, the, does the kid have a reading issue? And then what is what is being asked of the kid in the school? And, and what is the, the SRO or somebody done to potentially provoke that, that kid? Um, or have they, on the flip side, de-escalated the situation? You know, th these are all relevant factors. Sometimes what happens at the MDR is the school is just like, well, the kid had a, has ADHD and he punched somebody. And that's not you know, that's not an attentional issue. So end of story, like no, no manifestation. Um, so that's, that's, what's tricky. And, um, you know, that's, that's the work we do as attorneys is, is arguing that. And as, as those of you at the law school know, everything's an argument, right? So it's, 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 it's hard. <laughs> Well, thank you both so much for such a fruitful conversation. Um, this is, um, we've, we've come to the end of our uh, series for today. So yes, thank you again, Matthew and Marilyn, and we will see you soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Marilyn. Thanks, thank you everyone. very much. Thank you.